Great, thank you. Um, so for our next paper, uh, we'll go right into it. It's uh, Juliana von Fertz, uh, who is from Jena, and her topic today is to adorn the dead body, the representation of the deceased prince in and outside um, of the grave, the 13th to 15th centuries. So please. Yeah, hello to everybody. I'm glad to be here. And um, while a big part of my work is also dedicated to the Mongols, uh, today I'm turning to medieval Europe. While the funeral monuments of the Christian Middle Ages have attracted the interest of a wide range of art historians for a long time, I refer here to the fundamental studies of Panofsky, Bauch, and many others, the examination of the mortal remains inside the tomb seemed to belong exclusively to the research areas of anthropologists, archeologists, and textile historians. Working on both, medieval sculpture and medieval textiles, I have always been interested in the relationship between the image of the deceased outside and the funeral equipment inside the tomb. More often than not, the representation of the dead body inside and outside the tomb do not really correspond or do not correspond at all. Linking the interests of the art historian with the curiosity of the cultural historian and the textile researcher, I would like to explore here the question of why. She is closely linked to the problem of the adequacy of the representation of the corpse in the coffin and the sculptural image on the tomb. To whom were they addressed? To the people, to the living or future members of the family, to the, to the deceased himself or to God? I'm not the first one to embark on that path. In 2004, Ettore Napione, curator of the Museo di Castelvecchio in Verona, organized an exhibition on the textiles found in the sarcophagus of Can Grande della Scala, ruler of the city of Verona, who died from poisoning in 1329. The catalogue did not only focus on the examination and classification of Can Grande's mortal remains, including a great variety of garments and thick silken cloths, but also considered the eventful history, aesthetic appearance, and iconographic program of the tomb monument. This monument, erected by Can Grande's successor, Mastino II de la Scala in the 1330s or 1440s is integrated in the porch of the church of Santa Maria Antiqua in Verona. It consists of different levels. On the platform above the porch stands the sarcophagus which contains the corpse of Cangrande. The stone figure of the deceased lying on the death bed appears above of it. In the 14th century, one could see both of them from inside the church. Sarcophagus and bed are crowned by a stone and canopy from the top, Kangandra on a horse with a, a slight turn of his head, this benevolent attitude is addressing the people. At least one of the two sculptures representing Kangrande is in accordance with the remnants inside the sarcophagus. The gison on the death bed is closed in a court dress consisting of a coat with a buttoned front and buttoned sleeves, a long tunica and a cap. The reconstruction of the perverse textile fragments from inside the tomb make it clear that the corpse was indeed clad in a floor length sopra vesta and a coat, both made of silk patterned with gold. His hood and his shoes were also made of silk. In and outside the grave, Cangrande was equally dressed as a courtier, not as a warrior. The sword, which function in Cangrande's stone and image as a symbol of Cangrande's personal force and military power, seems also to reflect the content of the grave, where the real object had been preserved. The rather close correspondence between the burial equipment and the sculpture may find an explanation by the fact 
that the monument was executed only some years after the death of Cangrande, maybe still under the impression of the funeral festivities. However, the image of the courtier was not enough. The statue of the rider on the top of the roof focused on another aspect of medieval leadership, the ideal of knighthood shared by noble men north and south of the Alps. The representation of the prince as an armed knight on horse, ready to fight, makes quite sense because Cangrande had enlarged the territory of the Della Scala and secured the ascent of the dynasty by waging numerous wars against the neighboring towns of Verona. Keeping in mind that because of its elevated position, the horseman statue of Cangrande was well and distantly visible throughout Verona, one could be satisfied to interpret this complex word, work paid by his successor as a monument addressed to the family and the people of Verona to keep the memory of the Cangrande alive. But there is at least one irritating de detail. A closer look at the faces of the statues of Cangrande as knight and Cangrande as a courtier reveals that both times he is smiling gently a smile invisible for the spectators. The stone and image of the prince are smiling to whom? With this quick side of a glance to the group of the blessed from the last judgment of the Naumburg master in the cathedral of the city of Mainz, I will leave this question open for now. However, the visual information delivered by the sculptural images of the deceased prince are necessarily reduced. As an example, the fact that all of Cangrande's garments, the coat, the tunica, the hood, as well as the shoes had been made especially for the funeral, one may only learn from the remnants from inside the tomb. The same is true for the used textile material, which consists exclusively and completely of a wide variety of silks from Asia imported from the territory of the Mongol Empire to Europe. The example of Cangrande's grave reveal that the material findings from inside the tomb and the sculptural images complement each other just because they do not correspond. Each in his own way, they refer to a key event in the life of a medieval prince, his physical death. As all of you know, in medieval Europe, it's what, it was not unusual that the tomb monument was commissioned already before death or more often executed only a long time after the burial had taken place. Keeping that in mind, the sculptural image, which adorns European tombs of noblemen and women since the 12th century, could be described as an anticipation or a memory of the lying in state at the funeral. Whereas the equipment of the corpse is a relic resulting from acts which had actually taken place. The image and the corpse form only parts of a larger entity, the solemn event of the funeral festivities. The obvious purposes of the obsequies was to mourn the physical death and departure of the prince and to welcome his successor. But let me remind you that for the faithful believers of Christianity, there was nothing final about death. Physical death was understood as being the threshold between the earthly existence and um, the eternal life. In a very different way, the effigy and the corpse in the coffin are both determined to prepare the future life of the deceased who was waiting for the last judgment and for final salvation. Using the examples of the great dukes of Burgundy, Philip II and Philip III, called Philip the Bold and Philip the Good, I will try to reconstruct that historical entity of the funeral with its different actors. From here, I will finally come back to the question of the adresy of the tomb as well as the funeral equipment. Let's start with Philip the Bold, fourth son of the French King John the Good, from 1364 onward, brother of King Charles V of France and founder of the House of Burgundy. In 1363, he received the Duchy of Burgundy as a fiefdom from his father. It took him only a few decades to enlarge his territory significantly by marriage and war. 
1404, when he died, the counties of Flanders and Artois, which their rich towns already belonged to Burgundy. Nonetheless, thinking of death and preparing that death most carefully was a central topic of the life of this worldly man. At the age of 35, in 1377, Philip founded the Chartreuse de Chamol and let it build as a funeral pantheon for his family. The idea to have his own cloister with 24 Carthusian monks praying for his soul was important for him. Although the whole area, including church, cloister and 24 individual cells for the monks was generally not accessible to the people, Philip instructed the most outstanding painters and sculptures of his time, like Jean de Monet, Bumetz, Melcher Bruderlam, Jean de Marie, and Klaus Slüter to equip the cloisters, the cells and the church with, with outstanding works of art. Klaus Lüther's monumental Well of Moses, placed in the center of the cloister, being only the most famous of them. Philip the Bold planned to be buried in the choir of the church in front of the altar. As, as, early, as, um, as early as 3085, nearly 20 years before his death, we find the great sculpture Klaus Lüther, member of the workshop of Jean de Marie, working on the monument made of black marble and white alabaster. From all we know, Klaus Lüther, most important sculpture from around 1300, was responsible for the famous mourners called Pleurons. And I show you two other examples. Who, and these Pleurons form a solemn procession Filling the niches around, uh, the, uh, filling the niches of the elaborated microarchitecture which ornates the base of the monument. The lying figure of the Duke was only executed after the death of the prince by another sculptor named Klaus de Werf, but surely Philip had known and approved of the plan. Today, it is difficult to imagine the original state of the Gidon, the tomb figure, because it had nearly been completely destroyed in the French Revolution while the Florence remained untouched. The reconstruction of the 19th century, which replaced the lost original, will make us believe that Philip was presented as a courtier and a ruler, clad in a long white coat with a white collar, crowned by two, an uh, crowned by two angels with a kind of tiara. However, an aquarelle of the Baroque painter Jean-Philippe Galcan from 1736 delivers the lost composition, which was obviously far more original. There, the prince is still wearing the white mantle over a robe or a doublet with white sleeves as well as a tiara. But where the coat opens up, the spectator gets a glance of the shining armor that the prince was wearing under the soft fall of the coat. The two different roles of the medieval prince, the courtier and the armed knight, which were represented in Verona in two different sculptural images of Cangrande, are unified here in one and the same figure. This double role is underlined by the two angels on the head of the composition who holds Philip's helmet over the princely tiara. From contemporary sources we know that the corpse of the dead Philip the Bold was clad into a Carthusian monk's habit before being placed in a coffin made of lead. That habit was quite new and was bought for eight écus d'or, that is a gold coin, uh, from a Carthusian monk from a Chartreuse near the city of Halle in the Netherlands where Philip the Bold had died. Unlike the case of Cangrande de la Scala, there was a clear divergence between the image of the duke on the tomb as courtier and knight and the closing of the prince inside the coffin. This is most interesting because this divergence is not the result of changed external circumstances, but very probably was in accordance with the wishes of the deceased. The Carthusian habit is the representation of a third role Philip may have dreamed of, that of the prince who turned his back to the world to dedicate this, his life to the service of God. 
what seems to be a very personal decision at first glance, a proof of Philip's piousness, is in effect an invitation of the attitude of the most important member of the Capetian dynasty, Louis IX, King of France, who died in 1270, and because of his spirituality and pious mind, was venerated at his lifetime by the French people as a saint and was canonized in 1297. In his ostentatious hum humility, he, the King of France, went much further than Philip when already during his lifetime he used to wear a Cistercian monk's habit and liked to sit on oars, rejecting the kingly habit as often as he could. In 1228, he had the Cistercian Abbey of Royaumont built, where the early deceased princes of his family found their filing, finding, final resting place. With the construction of the Chartreuse de Chamol, Philippe the Bold, who had been at this time also the brother of a living king of, king of France, followed a kingly model. Looking at the tomb of the younger brother of that King Louis IX of France, Prince Philip Dagobert, who died in 1232 at the age of 10 and was buried in the Cistercian, Cistercian Abbey of Royaumont. And only after the revolution, um, his uh, tomb was um, transferred uh, to um, Saint-Denis, it becomes obvious that it could have served as a model for the tomb monument of Philip the Bold. The two kneeling angels flanking the head of the prince are there, as well as the lion under the feet. Most important, there is also the prefiguration of the mourners filling the blind arcades around the socket. Other than in Chamol, where the mourners consist of representatives of different sectors of society, in the tomb from Riemont, we find Cistercian monks alternating with angels. The reclining figures of the princes in Royaumont and Chamol, with one or two cushions under their heads, as well as the mourners on the base, refer in some way to the real funeral ceremony. The monument of Philip Poe, a high-level official in the court of Burgundy under Philip the Good and Charles the Bold, who was elected member of the Order of the Golden Fleece in 1463 and died in 1493, seem to illustrate that idea. As Philip the Bold, 80 years before, he himself commissioned his tomb in 1477. The unknown artist must have known the Chamol monument uh, because he did not only adapt the model, but developed it further in the direction of a striking realism. The eight mourners clad in long black robes and white black hoods, hiding their faces, carry the beer. Each one is equipped with the coat of arms of the Pole family. To make it more, still more realistic, each shield has a strip to carry it over the shoulder. There is no base that underlines the heavy burden of the beer. The black figures evoke the dramatic atmosphere of a theater play. The whole composition seems to process impressions of a real funeral. The truth is though that the sculpture combined two rather different moments of the funeral, funeral event, merging, merging them to create something completely new. Because the lying in state took place rather immediately or soon after the death, while the funeral procession, depending on the status of the prince or ruler, could last many hours and include different stations. Historical reports, as well as a variety of book illuminations from the 15th century, reveal that in most cases in the funeral procession, the deceased rested in the closed coffin. That coffin had to be covered with a precious pall made of silk and adorned with a cross. In the procession, as well in the, as in the funeral mass, that pall represented in a way, uh, represented and in a way substituted the deceased. In the royal pantheon of the kings, queens, princes, and princesses of Castilla and Leon, the wooden coffin enclosed, enclosing the corpse and the precious silken pall used in the funeral ceremony were seen as an inseparable unity. 
The poles were nailed on the coffin, and in some cases also the cross, inevitably belonging to the pole, was nailed onto the cloth and uh, on the coffin. In the case of Prince Fernando de la Cerda, son of the King of Castilla, who died in 1275, there were even two layers of cloth skillfully arranged on the coffin, like it must have been in the ceremony. Probably that coffin, which had been found in the stone and sarcophagus in Las Huelgas, in the stone and sarcophagus in Las Huelgas, and there, without any figure of the deceased, was the true remnant of the burial ceremony of that prince. That there was an intimate relationship between the pall outside of the coffin and the corpse inside is illustrated by an exceptional illumination in the famous Hours of War. In folio 159, uh, there is presented the naked body of a dead man stretched out on a precious cloth. The red cross attached to the cloth patterned with golden stripes, signaling silk material is meant, also signaling that silk material is meant, makes it clear that this is a pole just like the one spread out on the coffin in the burial ceremony. The corpse is speaking to God, citing Psalm 31, in your hands I commit my spirit. God appears above him against a deep blue background filled, filling, filled with, um, with a lot of angel heads. He is bearing the sword of the judge, God, and is accompanied by St. Michael waging the souls of the dead. What happens here is an inversion from the interior to the exterior. The corpse is lying on the pall and not beneath. In that composition, the pall function as a shout, but there is more behind it. The illuminator presents the corpse to the spectator that way God would have seen him. God is, so to speak, seeing through the sarcophagus, recognizing and judging the man as he is, naked and without all his worldly glamour. This sense is underlined by his words, do penitence for your sins, in judgment you shall be with me. The contrast between the naked corpse without any adornment and the precious cloth underneath together with the dialogue between the deceased and God points out to the complex problem of the status of the dead body in Christian medieval culture. For the future life in eternity, it was, not, it was not necessary to keep the body intact, as Andreas Wesel underlined even in the 16th century. One single bone would be enough for the God, the Almighty, to reconstruct the whole body. Much important to, the sa to, to save the entering to paradise were the constant prayers of the living, called memoria, called memoria. To know the place of the interment and to look at the sculptural image of the deceased in speaking prayers helped to realize that memoria. Since the high middle ages for the noble and religious elites, including the Pope and the great bishops, the kings and the princes, that disregard for the dead body was only a theoretical one, as we will see in what follows. Finally, at the end of my talk, coming back to the Dukes of Burgundy. I will focus at least on the embalming of their dead bodies. When I spoke of the image of, uh, of, of Philip um, the Bold on the one hand and his Carthusian ha habit of his corpse, I was orbiting around a lost center, the burial ceremony, which implied the treatment of the body of the deceased. Because the Dukes of Burgundy encouraged not only bureaucracy, including the precise accounting of their goods, but also historiography, it is rather easy to reconstruct the cause of the burial ceremony of Philip the Bold, who died on the 27th of April, exactly 1680 years in the Netherlands city of Halle. It's a nice coincidence. Um, with regard to the death of Philip the Good, who died on the 15th of June, uh, 1467 in his town palace in Bruges, the most important document is a letter this is our Philip the Good, also that's the successor of this um, Philip the Bold. And uh, in his case, the, the most important um, uh, document about, around his death is a letter written by a certain Pauli Boulon, 
pharmacist and citizen of Lille. Boulon was a very successful pharmacist who was present at the death of that prince. In that document, written on the 16th of June, only one day after the death of the Duke, the pharmacist describes meticulously what happened after the Duke had passed away. After having struggled with death for 12 hours, the Duke died on the evening of June the 15th. On the, 15th. On the next morning, I quote, and shorten a little bit, he was laid on his bed inside two sheets. The arrangement gave the impression that he was still fine. After that, one let the people in to see the Duke who seemed to sleep, a half smile on his lips, the only sign of death was his paleness. The people passed along the bed and there was a great lamentation. At three in the afternoon, there was carried out a post-mortem examination. Heart, lungs and the entrails have been dissected. And after that, the body was embalmed and beautifully arranged to be presented to his son and successor, Charles the Bold. These acts executed in a fixed order, one by one, had to fulfill different aims. The lying in state, the lying in state happened first. The people, probably members of the household and the court, had to see it with their own eyes that the prince was dead. The dissection of the heart and the entrails served two purposes, to get to know the cause of death on the one hand and to get important parts of the body, so to say, to bury them on, di to bury them on different places to enhance yeah. the memorial. Philip's entrails remained in Bruges. His heart was buried in the church of the Celestines in Paris and his body was finally transferred to Chamol. Other than Philip Bo the Bold, he died, he, um, he did never get a tomb monument. Most interesting for us is the embalming of the body. The materials were expensive. It was executed by specialists, surgeons and pharmacists, knowing any kinds of plants and spices. In the 15th century, they could rely upon the knowledge of two outstanding surgeons, Henri de Montville and Guy de Chauliac, who were authorities on the field. And their treatises on the practice of the embalming ordered they ordered that after the dissection of the entrails, the body had to be filled up with a mixture of substances and spices as pepper, aloe vera, mercury, myrtle, mint, frankincense, cinnamon, copper, lime, and resins. It was very important to add fragrant substances to master bed odors. The prepared body had to be wrapped with bandages before being enclosed in the coffin. That coffin should be made of wood, as in the case of Las Suegas, or better of lead, as in the case of Philip II and Philip III of Burgundy, because, as uh, Mondeville uh, states, in that way, the damaged or undamaged body will be preserved for eternity, and there will be no disgusting stench coming from the sarcophagus until the day of the large just judgment. In the case of Philip the Good, uh, a lot of, in the face of Philip the Good, a lot of curcuma theodaria, white turmeric, a plant spending a wonderful fragrance, were added to the coffin lid. Here we are rather far away from the earlier theological discussion of the time with its disregard to the mortal remains of the physical body. Clearly, there was a strong social impact on the practice of the embalming when Mondeville writes on her about to embalm the human face, he explicitly speaks of the bodies of the rich. And you can see it. Uh, and I cite, um, in another way, the dealing with the bodies of the princes evokes the rituals around the remains of persons venerated at their lifetimes as blessed and saints. To close my talk, I want to go back to the burial of Philip the Bold whom's grave in Chamol we do know rather well by now. After his death in the city of Halle in the Netherlands, the event of the burial was prepared, including not only a rather short lying in state, the embalming, and I'm showing you just um, a written source, uh, and there is, um, uh, we can see that he had a, um, a coffin uh, made of lead. Uh, it was really expensive and 
uh, he was embalmed and so on. Um, also, um, the event of the burial was prepared, including not only a rather short lying in state, the embalming, the position in the sarcophagus, followed by the funeral mass and the bu burial procession, including different churches and cloisters in Halle. Imminent part of the event of the burial, bu burial uh, was the journey of the sarcophagus from the Netherlands to Dijon and Burgundy, where the Chartreuse of Chamol um, as its last resting place was waiting for the dead prince. On his last journey, lasting three weeks and including many stations in France as well as in Burgundy, the dead duke was accompanied by his three sons, his personal household and important members of the court. It was a goodbye of the ruler addressed to his people and at the same time, the change of government from father to son took place. The inner sense of the ceremonies around the death of a prince was to represent his passing away as a leave-taking and a new beginning. That was the heart of the burial event. To stage that with all the necessary magnificence was extremely expensive. In the case of Philip the Bold, it cost the enormous sum of 6,000 French golden accused. By comparison, for his, for his tomb monument, um, he paid only, as I say, paid only 3,612 3, livres. These are um, 1,204 golden écus. Philip's sons, Philip's sons were not able to pay that sum, so they had to lend that money, giving the golden tableware of the Burgundian court as a security. As we learn from the written sources, the money was entirely spent for the embalming, the lead sarcophagus and precious textiles, including the pall for the coffin, which was, which was a precious golden cloth adorned with a cross and the coat of arms of the Duke. The whole household, comprising some hundred people, had to be clad in black clothes, whereby the quality of the clothes varied in correspondence of the status of the wearer. One could say that on his last journey throughout his realm, the coffin with the corpse of the ruler, covered by the golden cloth, and the crowd of his household, clad uniformly in black, formed an aesthetic unity, representing the ruler and the household as one big body. It seems important to keep in mind that while Philip's burial, consisting of different acts stretched out in time and space with the most great pomp, which is known to us only via the written sources, was in spite of its ephemeral character, a mightful experience remembered and told in lively memory throughout genera generations. That lost reality of the event was a real concurrence for the tomb, which was not ready at the moment of his death and could be seen after completion only by members of the family and some heavy few ones. When one tries to categorize the addresses of the monument that was the public, in the case of Cangrande, the people of the town of Verona, in Chamol, the monks, as well as the family. The tomb helped them to memorize the prince and to pray for his soul, while while, in my opinion, the embalmed body was pre preferred in the first line for the eyes of God and for eternity to, to secure its resurrection and the last judgment. That wonderful but irritating smile on the face of Can Grande de la Scala is a hopeful anticipation of that last judgment were secured by the memoria of the living. The prince would be saved and his body intact be in paradise with God. Thank you very much.